Hi learners, it's Em from Sano Nerds, and this video is going to be on the male pelvis looking at scrotum anatomy. So what's in it for me? Well, every sonographer needs to have a really strong mastery of normal anatomy. So once we know our anatomy, we can understand what that looks like by ultrasound. It's also really important that we know the anatomy because it's closely related to the physiology, which all relates back to patient symptoms. Then lastly, when pathology is present, it will change what normal anatomy looks like. So we want to have a really good foundation to recognize normal versus abnormal anatomy. Between four and eight weeks gestational age, embryos with XY chromosomes begin to form testicles within the abdominal cavity. As human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG perfuses the embryo, the Leydig cells of the early testicles begin to secrete testosterone. In all fetuses, the genital tubercle develops between eight and nine weeks gestational age, becoming more apparent by ultrasound around 12 weeks. In fetuses with the XY chromosomes and the secretion of testosterone, the tubercle will develop into the penis, and at that time, the labioscrotal swellings fuse to form the scrotum. The testicles themselves then will typically descend into the scrotum around the 28th gestational week, but can take up to nine months postnatally. The testicle is covered in layers of tissue, and we'll go over each of these individually, but from outer to inner, we have scrotal skin, the tunica dartos, the cremaster muscle, the internal spermatic fascia, the tunica vaginalis, both the parietal and visceral layers, and then finally, the tunica albuginea. The fully mature testicles are found outside of the body in the scrotum. The scrotum holds both testicles and is divided in two halves. Externally, it is divided by the median raphe, and internally, it's divided by the tunica dartos. The cremaster muscles are found on each side of the scrotum surrounding the testicle epididymis and spermatic cord. The cremaster muscle allows for temperature control of the testes, pulling the testicle and scrotum close to the body for warmth and or protection, and relaxing away from the body to cool the scrotum and scrotal contents. The next layers of the scrotum and testicles are derived from abdominal wall structures. The tunica fascia and the peritoneum extend into the scrotum via the vaginal process. The vaginal process will essentially close off during development, separating the abdomen from scrotum. Inside the abdomen, next to the abdominal wall muscles, is something called the tunica fascia. As the tunica fascia passes past the vaginal process, it will become the internal spermatic fascia, lining the cremaster muscle. And it's the same idea with the peritoneum. Inside the abdomen, the peritoneum is a two-layered covering, and as it passes through the vaginal process, it'll become the tunica vaginalis, also with two layers. Like the peritoneum, the tunica vaginalis has two layers, the parietal layer, which is in contact with the rest of the scrotal wall, and the visceral layer, which is in contact with the testicle. So same idea, we've got the parietal on the wall side and the visceral layer, which actually covers the viscera or the organs. And in this case, it's the actual testicle. The tunica vaginalis does create a small amount of fluid and that's going to fill the space in between the two layers. Now remember this space as it will lead to very common pathology called a hydrocele. The tunica vaginalis mostly covers the entire testicle. There is one area that is in contact with the posterior scrotal wall connected by a ligament called the gubernaculum. The gubernaculum acts as an anchoring point for the testicle and draws the testes into the scrotum during development. There is a congenital variant in which the tunica vaginalis covers the entire testicle, and this is especially important when we talk about the causes of torsion or the twisting of a testicle. Another layer called the tunica albuginea covers the testicle itself. This is made of a dense fibrous tissue that extends into the testicle.
So again, from outer to inner, we have the scrotal skin, the tunica dartos, the cremaster muscle, internal spermatic fascia, the tunica vaginalis parietal layer, and then the visceral layer, and finally, the tunica albuginea. So let's take a closer look at the testicle itself. Now the tunica albuginea, remember, is a dense fibrous tissue, and this is going to extend into the testicle, forming scrotal septations. Now these scrotal septations are not seen by ultrasound, but they are going to converge together to form the mediastinum, which can be seen. The scrotal septations will create lobules. Now the lobules are not seen by ultrasound either, but they are home to important microscopic features of the testicle. There are about 250 to 400 lobules per testicle, and this is where spermatogenesis occurs, but we'll get more into that when we cover the physiology of the testicle. The seminiferous tubules are within the lobules, and they are going to converge together to form the straight tubules. The straight tubules then extend toward the mediastinum, where they will converge into the reedy testi. The reedy testis is a network of tubules at the hilar portion of the testicle, where the structures enter and exit, delineating a clear intra and extra testicular anatomy. The reedy testi is connected to the head of the epididymis via the efferent ductules. The efferent ducts or tubules bring the spermatozoa from inside the testicle to the epididymal head. The efferent ducts are also not seen by ultrasound. The epididymis is an extratesticular convoluted tube that wraps around the superior and posterolateral portion of the testicle. It is divided into the head, body, and tail. The epididymis is going to connect to the vas deferens. Inside the epididymis, the head receives the efferent ductules from the testicle. The head of the epididymis sits like a hat on the superior pole of the testicle. The small tubules inside the head of the epididymis will converge to form one tube, the ductus epididymis. This will travel through the body and then the tail of the epididymis, eventually connecting to the vas deferens. And this is the pathway for the sperm to leave the scrotum. The body of the epididymis can be seen more lateral and posterior to the testicle, and then the tail wraps slightly inferior to the testicle, but still remains mostly posterior. The spermatic cord is a suspensory structure of the testicle and serves as a space for things to enter and exit the scrotum. The spermatic cord consists of lymphatic ducts, nerves, the vas deferens, the cremaster muscle, the testicular artery, and venous pampiniform plexus. The testicular arteries are branches off of the aorta. They arise inferior to the renal arteries and come off more the anterior portion. They extend through the retroperitoneum into the inguinal canal, and then through the spermatic cord and to the testicle. At the testicular hilum, the testicular artery will pierce the tunica albuginea and enter the testicle and become the capsular artery. This is going to travel around the periphery of the testicle. The centripetal arteries branch off the capsular arteries and then travel along the lobular septations towards the mediastinum. The recurrent rami and the mediastinal artery are central in the testicles. Before reaching the mediastinum, though, the recurrent rami do curve back on themselves, almost representing a candy cane shape, and these are going to form the centrifugal arteries. In about 50% of patients, the mediastinal artery is seen clearly transversing through the center of the testicle. So again, we have the aorta which is going to give rise to the right and left testicular artery. The testicular artery then will travel into the scrotum via the spermatic cord and enter into the testicle at the hilum. 
Once inside the testicle, the outside artery is the capsular artery. The capsular artery then has branches called the centripetal arteries, which will enter into the parenchyma of the testicle. Off the centripetal arteries then, we have these branches that kind of curl back on themselves, forming candy cane shapes. These are called the recurrent rami, also known as the centrifugal arteries. There's also one large artery in about half of our patients called the mediastinal artery that will travel from the capsular artery to the mediastinum. Other scrotal arteries arise from the iliac artery. The iliac artery will give rise to the cremaceric artery, which will provide blood to the extra testicular structures. And it'll also give rise to the differential artery, which will provide branches for the epididymis and the vas deferens. Venous drainage in the scrotum is achieved through the pampiniform plexus. The pampiniform plexus resembles a net as multiple small veins connect to one another. The network of veins also serves to regulate the temperature of the testicles by allowing a large surface area of cooler venous blood to absorb heat from the arteries in the spermatic cord. So if we look at our picture here, we have the testicular artery coming in from the abdomen, carrying in very warm, oxygenated blood. The testicles are very sensitive to temperature, so that warm blood coming in from the abdomen could potentially cause physiological effects on the testicle. So the pampiniform plexus is this network of veins all around the testicular artery. And the idea is, is that as that warm blood comes in from the abdomen, these veins with a lot of surface area are going to absorb some of that warmth, causing the blood to cool just ever so slightly and just enough to not interrupt spermatogenesis. So that cooler blood will enter into the testicle and provide the testicle with oxygenated blood and then return to the abdomen via the pamponiform plexus. Now that pamponiform plexus will be important later as we learn about varicoceles. The pamponiform plexus will eventually reduce to about three or four veins exiting through the inguinal ring and into the abdomen. These veins will all converge again to form the testicular vein. On the right side, the right testicular vein connects directly to the IVC. So in our example here, we have the pampiniform plexus all joining together to form the right testicular vein, and we can see it entering into the IVC. On the left side, the left testicular vein connects to the left renal vein. So again, we have our pampiniform plexus converging together to form the left testicular vein, and we will see that connect into the left renal vein. This is also an important concept when we talk about varicoceles, as varicoceles are more common on the left side due to how the left testicular vein connects into the left renal vein. Congenital variants of the testicle are going to include soft tissue masses, which we know as appendages or appendices, having the testicles in the wrong location, or having abnormal numeration. Most testicles exhibit smooth borders. However, there may be a small mass or soft tissue protrusion off the edge. This is known as a testicular appendage or an appendix testis and is a remnant of the malarian duct from when the testicles developed. They are commonly seen near the superior portion of the testicle. Similarly, the border of the epididymis is also smooth, but an epididymal appendage can occur, and this is a remnant of the Wolfian duct. Testicles that fail to be in the scrotum fall into two categories, the cryptorchid testicles and ectopic testicles. Cryptorchidism is the failure of the testicle to descend into the scrotum. This is considered a congenital anomaly. The undescendant testicle is typically somewhere within the inguinal canal and can be corrected by bringing the testicle into the scrotum and attaching it to the scrotum wall, which is known as an orchial plexi. 
and its in testicles are at a greater risk for malignancy and torsion and are associated with infertility. So again, cryptorchidism is where a testicle fails to go into the testicle as normal. So on this one, we can see that the left testicle is in the scrotum where it is expected to be. Where cryptorchidism, we would find the testicles somewhere along the path of descent from the abdomen to the scrotum. But again, it just hasn't quite made it into the scrotum. And a lot of times that has to do with the gubernaculum. Again, that's kind of a ligament that's attached and it kind of draws the testicle in. The gubernaculum might not be present or uh, didn't do its job as it was expected to. So multiple reasons why this can happen, but usually it's a pretty easy fix. We find the testicle, draw it into the scrotum, and then attach it to the scrotal wall with an orchiopexy. Similar to cryptorchidism is testicular ectopia, and this is going to put the testicle in an abnormal location. So again, normal location is in the scrotum with the poles of the testicle kind of oriented in the superior to inferior position. Testicular ectopia can put the testicle in the scrotum in more of a transverse position, or we can see it in other areas that do not connect through that normal path down the inguinal canal. In our image here, we can see a couple uh, variations of testicular ectopia where the testicle is sideways in the testicle. We have one that's sitting kind of at the base of the penis. We can have one that's more into the leg or even behind the scrotum into the perineal area. Correcting testicular ectopia, especially from any of these locations, would be a little bit more involved as it does need a little bit more rerouting to get the testicle into the scrotum. Other congenital anomalies of the testicle has to do with the numeration of the testicles. Normally there are two testicles, but monorchia is the absence of one testicle. If a baby is born with only one testicle, it is usually associated with some sort of vascular interruption in utero. In the event of monorchia, it's usually suspected that it is a case of cryptorchidism or an ectopic testis, and we would need to confirm that with imaging or exploratory surgery. If we do not find another testicle, then the patient is diagnosed with one testicle or monorchia. Some people also have monorchia as a result of an orchectomy, where maybe the testicle was removed due to cancer or torsion, and sometimes they are replaced with an implant to restore symmetry in the scrotum. Anorchia is the absence of both testicles. This can also be seen as a result of interrupted blood flow in utero. Due to the low testosterone levels, the penis and the scrotal sac tend to be small and puberty is delayed in these patients. This is actually an image of a fetus with ambiguous genitalia and that yellow arrow is pointing at a small empty scrotal sac. After birth, the scrotal sac and penis still appeared smaller than normal. However, in this case, the testicles did end up being found in the inguinal canal. So this was not a true case of anorchia, but still has a similar presentation with a smaller penis and scrotal sac. And lastly, too many testicles is referred to as polyorchidism, also known as supernumerary testicles. This is also a pretty rare condition where more than two testicles may be present in the scrotal sac. The duplicated testicle is typically found on the left and is also at a higher risk for malignancy.